Revolution will not be right back after a message. people are behind me, but is that okay? I, maybe I need to go here. So nice to see you all. Thank you for being here. I know almost everyone, <laughs> but not all of you. My name is Lizzie Cooper Davis. I'm an associate professor here, director of the graduate programs in performing arts and theater education and applied theater. Um, and co-sponsors for this event are the Emerson Prison Initiative, the <laughs> represented by the amazing Betsy Chase. If you do not know about EPI, learn about EPI. It's a remarkable project. Also a co-sponsor is New Beginnings Reentry, represented by founding director, amazing <laughs> Stacy Borden. If you do not know about Stacy Borden or New Beginnings, find out. Your mind will be blown. <laughs> Um, we also have the support of the wonderful HowlRound Theatre Commons, also based here at Emerson, the global online hub for disruptive ideas in the theatre. <laughs> <laughs> Represented by Vijay Matthew, who is running the live stream of this event on HowlRound, so it will be archived on their site forever and ever and ever. And to be very, very clear, Oh, sorry. And Jamie as well, also obviously representing HowlRound. Sorry. Um, but to be very clear, the Howl the HowlRound, the live stream is happening just for the first 30 minutes of Jan presenting her work and ideas. And then when we ha open for conversation, the cameras go off, just to be very clear about that. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, oh, yeah. I promised everyone snacks. <laughs> and I promised everyone books for sale. And when the person came with the books, it was the wrong book. It was the hard copy, the green Bible, instead of the soft copy. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll send a link to buy the book. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> um, and so I also just want to thank Joy, who's been super helpful. Where is Joy? Oh, right there. Joy, Zara, who is here. Or yes, am I saying your name correctly? Zaria, who was super helpful. The folks in the booth. Oh, there's only one person left. <laughs> Wave. Yeah, everyone's been super helpful setting up and getting us ready. So thank you for joining us in the circle to hear from and be led by the extraordinary Jan Cohen Cruz. <laughs> For those of us committed to using the arts not as a distraction or a commodity or something reserved for the privileged few, but for a way to do the work of justice and joy, Jan is a guiding light. Her decades of remarkable scholarship and practice <laughs> have long grounded, guided, challenged, and supported our field. She has helped write our histories, led us to our essential questions, and invited us to step into this work with rigor, humility, curiosity, clarity about commitments and accountabilities, and eagerness to build the world we want. Thank you. The formal bio, Jan is a writer, educator, practitioner of community-based performance art. She, serves as direct, she served as director of Imagining America, artists and scholars in public life from 2007 to 2012, and was also director of field research for A Blade of Grass, an organization supporting socially engaged artists. She writes on the work of performance artists who address social issues and has authored or co-authored eight, is that right? eight extraordinary books. Grounded in the resistant theater of the late 60s and early 70s, she was a member of the New York City Street Theater Jonah Project and has been a freelance practitioner of the Theater of the Oppressed Techniques of Augusto Boal. After receiving her PhD in performance studies at NYU, she taught in the drama department there for 28 years, founding their applied theater minor. She continues to write and offer workshops. And her new book, See Me, Prison Theater Workshops and Love, which we are here to learn and talk about, has been described as opening a new territory in prison theater writing. Rather than detail how different people are doing the work or try to surface best practices or otherwise give a bird's eye view, in true Jan style, hello, welcome. 
else and come in, get snacks. <laughs> in true Jan style, she is asking us to step in, in bolder and braver ways. To look at the intimate and vulnerable work that happens in the radical, humanizing, and precious space of relationship within the carceral context, which, as we know, is so invested in dehumanization. And a lot of what she explores here are not the successes and best practices, the rainbows and the butterflies, but are the challenges, the struggles, the missteps that inevitably come when doing the work invested in sewing and growing webs of interdependence and care across, within, and beyond the walls that divide us. And I promise you, it is a page turner. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you for being in the circle with us. Jan Pillen Cruz. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lizzie, for that remarkable introduction. And thanks to all the people who are co-hosting and co-sponsoring this. I won't repeat their names. You heard them, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, so yes, indeed, what we're going to do um, is you're going to hear some of the you're going to hear excerpts from the new book, Re uh, See Me, Prison Theater Workshop in Love. But what was happening to me, so I was sitting there figuring out, okay, I want to go around, I, I, wanna, I want people to hear excerpts from this book. And I kept hearing in my head the different people who contributed to the book. Uh, the book's in two parts. The first part takes us back to 1971, 1972, when I was in the New York City Street Theater Company and got invited to go into Trenton State Prison and co-facilitate a workshop. And uh, the communal work we did in that workshop, the collective creation, the getting to know the participants in the workshop made me realize that I had biases about people in prison. I didn't know I had biases about people in prison. But there I was, and I went, wow, you know, Quasi has such a clever, sly way about him. And, and you know, uh, Nine is, is such a political thinker, and Gill is such a poet. What, and, and my friend Richard, who I went in with, said, why are you so surprised? And I thought, you know, why am I so surprised? So applied theater people, of which I know there are many here, I have to say, um, I'm a big believer in field work for actors, that you just need to have some experience where you are working intimately with a group that you didn't know before. And if you're at all like me, which you probably are, you'll find yourself really surprised by things you didn't know. And the hope is that sticks. So even though you weren't, won't work with every single group out there, you'll learn enough from that one experience. And this was my, this was my foundational experience. So um, first, I'm going to uh, read a couple excerpts and play a couple excerpts from the person who I was closest with in the workshop, Finn. That's from part one of the book. Then we're going to turn to part two, and I'm going to play recordings of other people who did other theater workshops in prisons and also had extraordinary, very different kinds of experiences. Um, so let me see. Was there anything else I wanted to make sure to say? I think that's it. Okay, so first I'll read it. Um, how I described our very first workshop. I guess I should be right here. Although maximum security, Trenton State Prison was weirdly in the midst of a working class residential neighborhood. It had opened in 1836 and looked it. Thick bulky stone walls darkened with over a century of pollution and neglect. Razor sharp wire along the top, floodlights sweeping across the neighborhood all through the night tall, dominating watchtowers. Why would they build such a foreboding structure in a family neighborhood, I mused to Richard, the director of the street theater, who I'd be assisting. Do they care that little about the people who live here? Richard sighed, or maybe it's a warning. Once inside, about a dozen participants greeted us warmly, including a couple of Black Panthers, a Black Muslim, a Native American, one Jewish guy. And then there was Finn, who moved me from the moment I set eyes on him, appearing so sensitive and tough at the same time. Finn had his own interpretation of everything, which later, when he came out of hiding with me, he shared. He used to bend his knees a little when we stood next to each other to equalize our height. 
He had green eyes, red hair with little fringed bangs like a Benedictine monk, and seriously muscular arms. It's hard to believe now that it was the first time I realized that guys in prison work out not just because they had time on their hands, but also to protect themselves. That prisons are dangerous for the people there, not only places where dangerous people are locked away from the general population. That night, he looked so fragile that the air around him trembled. How was that possible with those arms? We began with warm-ups, some yoga-based, that the guys could do in their cells. We shifted to improvisation. Moments before the first session was to end, one of the guys, Kwesi Balagoon, said, I got something. This takes place on a street corner in Newark. Yeah. Little by little, people got up and hung out, sang doo-wop under an imagined street lamp, shot the breeze, looked at the stars. It was a remarkable sensation, recreating more vividly than the thing itself, something I could do any night but didn't, and they could not do any night soon. It was November 1st, 1971, my 21st birthday. And now, oh no, are you, please save your applause. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to read something that Finn wrote um, and, and that speaks to the workshop as a place participants could be fully seen. What do I mean by see me in the title of the book? After the success of the first show with skits and poetry readings, Richard announced, we did great, and we are now ready to move on to a major production, exploring one thing all of us here share, a radical sense of justice. I have learned about most of it through history and political theory, but all of you have learned it from experience. I chose a book we can adapt to stage, exploring bureaucratic injustice better than anything I have come across. Franz Kafka's The Trial. Handing each of us a copy of the book, he continued, I want everyone to read the book at a comfortable pace. Listen for any response that parallels an experience from your past. Then when we get together, we can start improvising with those scenes to construct a narrative reflecting how the oppression a prison life connects to Kafka's story, which is evidence of its universality. When we prisoners started to leave, Richard called to me, Finn, I was thinking about the best way to integrate personal experience with the scenes in the novel in the structuring of the play. I've read your writing and think you could help with that. If you mean take notes during the improvisation and link it to the Kafka narrative, I could do that. That's exactly what I mean, and thanks for offering. It was an epic event in my life. I had been purchasing prison-related literature and blindly purchased In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka. I was rewarded in reading another Kafka story, A Hunger Artist, experience a recognition of our tortured lives, whether chosen as exhibits on the world stage or something we loop around in unconsciously, can have meaning in artistic expression, and acting is primary for everyone. So, over the next few months, both the workshop um, and my relationship with Finn developed and deepened. When a fire closed the prison to the outsiders, Finn wrote the main workshop facilitator, Richard and me, explaining tensions among the subgroups that brought it about, dynamics I never would have understood on my own. I wrote back, here is how I describe in the book what happened next. And so began a deluge of letters. We wrote to each other about books, movies, politics, and philosophy. We wrote how we felt moment by moment. He never trivialized the relative ease of my childhood in relationship to the harshness of his own. We wrote about our everyday lives. We shared our takes on the workshop and the participants. 
we fell in love. We wrote outpourings of our love to each other. As anyone who has had a long distance love affair before the existence of the internet knows, letters became a space to be together. I focused on him and my consciousness curled into a place inside me for just the two of us. Every thought I wrote him went towards making two chairs alongside each other, a room where we could sit, a little house where we could live. Time slowed down, so careful were we both to find fitting words to carry our feelings and thoughts to the other. I hadn't known how to take time in a romance before, but now time was what we had. Holding the paper he had written on was touching him. After a few weeks, the prison reopened to outsiders and the drama workshop resumed. And now I'm gonna play another clip of Finn reading about a particular moment between us. One night at workshop, Jan and I took an extended personal break together off in a corner, sitting in schoolroom chairs with attached little tabletops. We traveled all the way in, the classroom disappearing, and at one point, either Jan or I placed the tip of an index finger on top of the tip of the other's index finger. And as those fingers rested there, a magnificent flow of libido energy began to flow at rapid speed throughout my body, yet never finding a concentration at the genitals. No conquering, no proving anything, no providing needs fulfillment, sexual or otherwise, and thus no hell of reciprocity present in a fair exchange act of consumer culture. It was an unrehearsed, unprepared gifting of each other to the other in a constant flow, being totally open to each other in love and trust, united inside a libido out of control, a roller coaster ride. Uh, so we learned a lot about the different ways that love gets expressed. I mean, it was the workshop, it was the letters, we had simultaneous dreams. Um, if you wanna know more about that story, you'll have to get the book, because now I wanna, <laughs> I, I want to, what, what, what we wanted was to say, there are prison theater workshops going on all over the world, right? And let's look at ways, let's look at some of these other prison theater workshops. Let's have other conversations between two or three people who went through an experience together to hear more about it. So that's what part two is. Part two is five chapters that are exactly that. And this first one in part two is you're gonna hear three people. Um, they were all part of the drama club at the Louisiana Women's Correctional Institution. And the three voices, the first one is Mama Glow, Mama Glow Williams, who while not a facilitator, was a real leader in that workshop. And she was incarcerated 51 years, uh, longer than any other woman in Louisiana. And by the fact that she was known as Mama Glow, and there's someone here who actually has also met her, um, you get a sense of what, how she used that time and the kind of person she was. Uh, then you're gonna hear in the conversation from Osetua, um, Amor Amon Kam, who was one of the co-facilitators co who really brought a kind of African philosophical consciousness to the group, and then from Kathy Randalls, who started the club. We were a family in the prison drama club. It was a healing place. I protected the club with my life. If I spill my guts about the ugly things that happened in my life, like the man in the yellow house, and if he chose somebody, they'd say, Mama Glow gonna get you. What went on in the drama club stayed in the club. You could be your real self there. We were sacrificial lambs putting our pain out to try to release them from their pain that they were going through. But before you walked out the door, you took out the phony mask for the compound 
and put it back on. I said, when you first came to drama club, you said you didn't intend to stay. What happened? Well, it was an ancestral connection. I really felt connected to all of you. I didn't expect that. I was just coming from one Saturday after Kathy invited me. It was a pure example of how love just spontaneously sprouts, especially after going to the prison training where everything was told, don't touch them, don't this, don't that. I got to the drama club and there were all these black women, some of them my daughter's age, some of them my mother's age. It was pure love. You see, I'd been to Angola, the men's prison, before with Kamuka Africa German Dance Collective. And by giving our time to the inmates at Angola, we were manifesting the concept of Ubuntu. I am because you are. We understood that our destiny was tied to their destiny. The African concept of life extends beyond the present. It includes those of us who are living now, those of us who lived in transition, the ancestors, and those souls waiting to be born. In African culture, the community is where all three of these existences are actualized and observed. The individual is born into the community, and even after death will always be a part of the community, just as our incarcerated family members are. Well, Kathy, what brought you to the drama club? Being dumped by my first lover after two weeks. Mm. <laughs> That led me to connect to the deep, raw heart of every woman who has been wronged by a man. And it led me to want to talk to the women who killed the men who wronged them, wondering if murder appeased the rage inside. All of that culminated in a solo performance called Rage With and Without. My first contact with women who had killed was in 1994 through the Illinois Clemency Project for Battered Women. One of them, who I told I was going back home to New Orleans, said, well, keep working with the women in prison down there. Now, when people ask me why I've stayed in the drama club, I say, nobody told me I couldn't. I was curious. All the doors opened to let me in. I have healing to offer. I need healing. Y'all being locked up here ain't right. It doesn't sit well with my spirit. You asked me to come back. You pray for me and my well-being when I come. The performances here are the best on the planet. And I hate violence. I hate violence and what it does to us. And I know that the majority of y'all are in here for committing a violence that ended a life. And I know that behind your violence was a violence that you received, a hurt that nobody ever apologized much less atoned for. Mama Glow, close us out. We are a community. I'm part of that community, but I are incarcerated part of that community. Now that I am free, I want to be an active part of my community. I want to help change some of the things that's in a justice system that is so cruel and unfair. Join me in the fight. And thank all of you that helped free me. So this next one um, is from founder John Bergman and early member Saul Hewish of Geese Theater. Uh, they worked both in the UK and the US, and they were the first company in the English-speaking world, at least, to 
make plays with people in prison, not only bring plays to prisons or do workshops in prison. First you'll hear Saul, then you'll hear John, and you'll hear them together. One of my defining prison experiences was the first time that I worked with life sentence prisoners. I'd been asked to make a show with them, and I was a bit terrified by the notion, not because I thought they were going to hurt me, but rather it was, what do I do with them? I was in my late 20s, a skinny white kid with long hair, and I'm thinking, what the fuck do I know about being a lifer? Nothing. So I used the show to find out. The men were extremely generous in sharing their experiences, and the show had some great moments. I remember at the end, a participant came up to me and said, that's the best week I've had in prison, ever. My initial response was feeling overwhelmed by the weight of the comment, followed by a concern that I didn't really know how to respond. In the end, I was just honest with him and I said, this is one of the best weeks that I've ever had as well. Those shared experiences and their shared life experiences inside this theatre process are so compelling. You know, we're not the same as artists who go off and make something commercial. We work for the good of the people we interact with. What the fuck does it say about us that we're more interested in the experience of working in a room in the back of shit with a bunch of guys to make something than we are in wanting to be famous actors or wanting to be on television. There's a fundamental thing for me that doing drama and theatre in prison is so core to my identity and my sense of myself that if it wasn't there, I wouldn't really know who I was. Maybe that's because I came to this work when I was barely 21 and from 1987 till stopping work with you in the States in 97. I didn't talk about anything other than prison, prisoners and theatre. It was certainly formative of my professional identity, but it goes deeper than that. I had a friend, you know her, who called this work throwaway theatre, really put it down. She hated it. Yeah, but the thing is, it's not throwaway theatre. Or you could say all theatre is throwaway. It's temporal. I mean, it's fucking there and then it's gone, right? But actually, we know that it wasn't throwaway because it was real. Even when the stories were invented, it was all about the men and their struggle right there to get it right, show their kids, show the officers. It was about them trying something new. And we helped them get there. You know, one of my memories is of a Texas prison. 500 guys and an evening performance. An inmate group singing Motown songs. They sang those before the performance started. They were dressed in these fancy waistcoats and they could really harmonize. As we got to the end of the show, which was really dark, I went over to the group and said, could you sing out the end of the show? It's just downbeat. I leave it up to you. And they watched. And they came in at the last moments in the show and they sang this beautiful song. Silence. 8 p.m. in a prison in Texas. 500 men and us holding on to the beauty that had just happened for as long as anyone could. Perhaps even some hope, if just for a moment. And the feeling of the translucency of all the arts and all our places in that light, that stayed with me for always. Uh, the final chapter is a conversation among the contributors. I said, you have to read each other's chapters. They're they're so interesting, and a lot of people did, and they sort of pulled out what were some of the themes in the whole book, and they had a conversation about it. So you're going to hear um, two, from two different people and what they added to that conversation. Well, this next one is Jess Thorpe, who does theater workshops in Scotland. 
Um, and her chapter in the book, she co-wrote with a prison warden who at first was like, oh, I can't believe they're bringing this into a prison. I can't stand it. And he ends up, he's on her board now. He watched what happened. It was a juvenile detention center. And he watched what happened to the young men. And he said, they're looking me in the eye. They care about what they're doing. They're always on time for this. Let's have more of this. It's a very beautiful chapter. Anyway, here she talks about what happens, the very critical issue of what happens when people get out. A benefit of living in a small country is that we only have 15 prisons. I work in six or seven of them regularly, so I see the same people and can track their progress. It's my dream to have a cultural program in all of them. And I don't think it's so far away, we are already talking about it. It's exactly what other contributors to the book are saying. Most important is creating opportunities when people come out of prison. And I stay in touch with people that I meet in prison. I'm doing a podcast with one of them who's out now. And I recently went to a church with a woman who'd just been released because she felt that they weren't listening to her. So I was there just to be an advocate for her because we have a relationship. It started in the prison, but it can extend to the outside. We constantly try to map the prison's geography within Scotland to find opportunities for people back in their communities. We run a youth theatre in a prison and recently invited youth theatres from the areas where those young people live to offer them places in their companies when they get out. I worked in a theatre in Dundee and getting people out there to work with us too. I want to create inroads into Scottish society and get away from the othering we do to people in prisons. Only doing theatre programmes in prison isn't going to change anything. It can just seem like prisoners have more opportunities than the rest of the community, and it doesn't respond to the bigger picture. There's got to be a what next when people leave. I give them my email and I say, come and have a coffee and let's just see what you can get involved with. So this last, this last excerpt is by Alexander Anderson, um, who co-wrote a chapter with Kevin Bott. Um, Alex participated in when he was incarcerated and now he's out and he co-directs Kevin's performance-based collective process for returning citizens to remove the stigma and shame of incarceration upon the completion of their sentences. So they're free inside as well as outside. So Alex closes the book and he's closing this, these little excerpts um, with the book's foregrounding of love. I had three older brothers who were Black Panthers or Malcolm X followers. They'd always gave me that speech about not being an offender, but being a defender of the Black community. So I always knew it. But there were two forces in my neighborhood, and I sided with the streets. Once I got incarcerated and got that moment of clarity, separated from drugs, money, gangs, it started coming back to me. Meeting some of the political prisoners that I heard about, they're the ones who taught me about being a revolutionary. I said, yeah, give me that gun. And they said, no, a revolutionary is a lover of humanity. You don't get a gun. You got what you need, compassion, love to do this work. When I came into a space with people who just got out, I wanted to share with them what I knew about the power of using theater to change narratives from being in workshops with Kevin. And I got my heart broken. I got, we don't want to hear from you. We want to hear from the white guy, meaning Kevin, who I partnered with when I got out. We were working on it, but I still do this work to engage with people out of love of humanity and to heal humanity. I'm glad we're talking about love. I had three older brothers who were Black Panthers So that's what, that's what you're going to hear from the book for today. And uh, I hope it provides us with some common ground when we do move into the discussion. But before we do, I want to ask you to um, just grab someone who you didn't come in with today. And I want you each to tell 
a story to the other for about three minutes of just of whatever bubbled up in your head listening to these readings. It might not have anything to do with prison, maybe love or community or a great theater experience. And in about three minutes, I'll say switch so the other one gets to tell a story. So find someone and then we'll reconvene.